Hi, Dr. Mori. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. How are you? Hi, uh, I'm very, very fine and uh, I'm very happy to, to be here today. So France is very, very far away from Chile. Yeah. But uh, look, we are we are sitting uh, <laughs> side by side now. Yeah, <laughs> great, um, great. Uh, please uh, share your screen, and you can start uh, whenever you want. Okay, great. So I think it's it's shared now. Can let you me, see it? Let me see. Yeah, we are okay. Excellent. So yes, it's a it's a great pleasure for me to uh, to speak and to uh, contribute to that uh, symposium, and uh, I'm very happy to close the session today. So I'm going to talk about uh, these topics of force, velocity, and power assessment, and uh, applications to jumping and sprinting. So if you want to connect with our research and follow our research, you can connect to my website or you can follow us on, on social media and mainly Twitter. So first of all, I want to thank uh, my team because I'm lucky to be, uh, let's say, the head coach of a very good team of uh, great people. So people from almost uh, all the other places in the world contributed to the works I'm going to present. So this is not my work. It's definitely our work and uh, I thank all the guys here. So the research process, as I see it, is a bit like this picture. Uh, we try to explore some hypotheses, we try to explore some new ways, some new roads, and everything I'm going to present here today <clears throat> has started in 2007. And so it means that some of the things I will present you today maybe are wrong hypotheses and they will lead nowhere and i'm sorry for that <laughs> but some of the things i will present you today are useful have been validated and are used in uh, high level sports so i think it's uh, part of the research some tracks open new fields some tracks close some doors and that's that's the way we we go forward so the main philosophy is that we go from field questions from coaches, athletes, doctors, physiotherapists, to work on these questions in our laboratory, to test some things, to write some papers, of course, because we need to publish, and then we take the solutions back to the field. And so this is a circle of research that goes from field questions back to field answers and new questions. And if you want to read a paper to start and discover our research, I advise that you read this paper from 2016 uh, that's available online. So basically today, um, when you coach people or when you train people, you have plenty of data. You can, you can generate data with your iPhone every day, with your watch when you go running. And the big question is, we should be able to better individualize training. And I think everybody agrees on that. But the real question is, how can we do that? How can we base the individualization of training uh, on the data that we collect? So basically, our approach is macroscopic. We have a macroscopic approach of the performance. We start with the big picture of the puzzle, not with little pieces. We start with the performance output of the athletes. And this is um, a philosophy that was uh, given by some mentors in the field, for example, of biomechanics, especially Professor Di Prampero, who was my uh, PhD uh, supervisor. And basically, the idea is we want to use models that are simple, because the simpler the model, the clearer it is which feature influences the calculated effect, which is the sports performance. So it doesn't mean that we um, neglect the underlying physiological mechanisms. It means that we take this, we study these mechanisms as a second step. So first performance, simply analyzed, simple outputs, and then physiological mechanisms. So very basic illustration here. If you take these two vehicles, two motors, they have about the same power output. So it means that the maximum power of these two vehicles 
is about 140 kilowatts. And now if you ask the question, which one can produce more force? You cannot answer that question because it will depend on the velocity of movement. So it means that, of course, the tractor will produce more force when the velocity is low. And the sports car will produce more force when the velocity is high. But in the opposite, it will be uh, another answer. So if you take some sports uh, examples here, this is bobsleigh. And what they want to do in bobsleigh is pushing the bobsleigh to go as fast as possible. And they go from zero, so very slow speed, to maximum speed. Okay? Exactly the same in cycling. In cycling, you start from zero velocity and you accelerate the bicycle every pedal downstroke. What is the objective of this rider? The objective is produce maximum force at every pedal downstroke. So it means be strong at low velocity, intermediate velocity, and maximum velocity. So you need to be strong in the entire spectrum. So I'm going to show you another example here with rowing. Basically, um, if you want to know exactly the characteristics of your athletes, you need to do the force velocity spectrum because you want to know how strong they are at every possible velocity of movement. So this has been done in the literature. This is not new. You have here on the screen many examples of force velocity spectrums in many different exercises. So you have cycling, bench press, squatting, horizontal squatting, pedaling, sprinting. Every time you do a full movement with the lower limbs, you have a linear force velocity uh, spectrum relationship. So basically, if you remember physiology, uh, there's a difference because in physiology, we know that the muscle fiber and the muscle itself has a different type of force velocity relationship. And this has been discussed and everybody now agrees. The force velocity relationship is different if we talk about the microscopic muscle or if we talk about the macroscopic sports exercise. And in the case of macroscopic actions, such as jumping or sprinting, we have a linear relationship. So now I'm going to explain you a, a study that we did and published in 2018. And this graph that you see here, I'm going to explain, this is not the reality. This, is, this graph is science fiction. This is something that I made up. In this graph, you see the force velocity relationship in jumping for many different athletes. And this illustration shows what many coaches think. Many coaches think that the higher your maximum force, the higher your maximum velocity. So it means that many people think that to be faster, you need to be stronger because it will transfer to more speed. Okay, so this is why maybe some coaches um, advise heavy strength work to improve velocity. Now I'm going to show you the reality. The reality is like this. And this was some measurement that we did on more than 500 athletes in different sports. And basically the reality says, mm -mm, it is not that simple. The reality says, if you take a big group of athletes, like a rugby team, a football team, a track and field group, you will find many different types of profile. You will find some very high force, low velocity, very high force, high velocity, etc. And what you see here on the graph is that there is absolutely no correlation between the maximum force of somebody and their maximum velocity. So the first conclusion of this study, and this is pretty clear, strong at low velocity doesn't mean strong at high velocity. So this is a big consequence for training. And also, it is absolutely not clear that improving your maximum force at low velocity will transfer to improving your force at high velocity. So if you think about the example of the cyclist before, it means that if I improve my capability of pushing the pedal at the beginning of the sprint, when the movement is low, it doesn't mean that I will be pushing the pedal 
harder when the movement is super fast. So we have to keep in mind that there is a lot of different force capability. And for example, some athletes like these two uh, young men here show that you can run super fast without having a maximum force output that is very high. Because these two individuals, one of them is French, the other one is Canadian, they were able to run the 100 meter in less than 10 seconds. So this is world-class level. And they almost never did heavy strength training and they didn't have a high force at low velocity. But they had a lot of force when their body was moving fast. And this is the objective of a sprinter. So now the big question is, uh, how can we measure that? So I'm going to um, have two parts in my talk. The first part will be the vertical profiling, jumping. And the second part will be the horizontal profiling, sprinting. So last year, we published a paper where we discussed the fact that jump eight, the eight of jump in a test, is not a very good indicator of power output. We discussed that, and basically, when you want to assess the force velocity profile of somebody in a laboratory, you have to do what's on the fast video here. It means you have to find different loads, you have to jump with these different loads, and you have to measure force output and velocity output, and you have to build this relationship. So, of course, the maximum force here on the left is close to the 1RM, the maximum repetition. This was discussed in one of our studies. The squat jump, which is a very popular test, is in the middle of the relationship. So it means that when you do a squat jump, you're exactly in the middle of your force velocity spectrum. And if you want to do faster movements than the squat jump, you have to use unloaded conditions. So we did a horizontal jump, you can do assisted jumps, but what you need to observe here is that the experimental points that you collect are still on that relationship. So this is very uh, easy to do in the laboratory, but you need a force plate, which is very costly, and you need sometimes some video analysis, which is also costly. So this is a bit frustrating, and so in 2008, we published a new method to answer that question. How can we do with field devices? Okay, so how can I do if I'm a coach and I cannot go to a lab? So this was done by Pierre Samosino, my colleague and friend. And basically, I won't go into the details of the, the computation, but you have to remember that in 15 minutes, just using some scales to have the body mass, using two to four good loaded jumps and measuring jump eight. This is something you need to measure. You can calculate the force, the velocity, and the power during the push with these simple equations, okay? So it's very easy to do. You just have to measure body mass, jump eight, and the push of distance, which is easy to do. Of course, this method has been validated in our group, but also in other groups. So we have today five studies that confirm the validity of this method. And we published an Excel spreadsheet that you can find on my website, it's free, where you can implement this method easily. So basically here, um, we started to do some measurements with coaches, and one of the questions from the coaches was this one, okay, I know that power is the product of force and velocity. So it means that if two athletes have the same level of maximum power, you remember the two cars, the tractor and the sports car, both have the same power output and they have different profiles. So for example, the athlete on the left is a very high velocity profile and the athlete on the right is a very high force profile. The question of the coach volleyball coach, basketball coach, rugby coach, who knows? The question is, who jumps higher? Who has the best performance? So if you want to answer that question, it's very difficult. Because if you want to answer that question, you need to find some people like 
on the right, you need to find some people like on the left, and you need to compare their jump height. And believe me, this is difficult. So this is why we use mathematics and modeling. And in this paper, in uh, the Journal of Theoretical Biology, we validated a model of jump height that allowed us to simulate and answer that question. So basically, don't be afraid with the equation. I know it's Saturday, and but you know it's it's pretty simple mathematics. This equation gives the takeoff velocity, so it means the jump performance, as a function of three things: maximum power, the slope, the orientation of the force velocity profile, and the push-off distance. So it means that with this equation, we don't need to find some subjects. We will play with the equation to simulate the answer to the question. So first things is that we validated this equation. So basically, this was done in Italy. We showed that this equation had a prediction uh, power of 95%. So it means it's almost perfectly correct. And the second thing that we did is that we simulated that equation. And basically, this graph is pretty easy to understand. This graph says, if you have a certain amount of maximum power, but we change the value of the slope of the force velocity profile, your jump height is different. So it means that if you have what we call an optimal profile here, this is the blue spot, you have the ideal profile to jump high. But if you have too much velocity or too much force, your jump height is lower than the optimum. So it means, and this is not a small difference, it's up to 30% difference. So it means if you want to jump high, you need to have a good power output. This is not new. But you also need to have a good balance between force and velocity. So the first study that we did was to collect jumping data on very high level people, footballers, uh, sprinters, rugby players. And we verified that yes, those who jump high have a good power output, but also a good balance between force and velocity. So to give you an example, I will talk now about what we call the optimized training. It means training people as a function of their optimal profile. So I'm going to show you an example that's a very famous athlete. Um, I was lucky to follow some people for the Olympic Games in France. And this is a swimmer. It's a sprinter. And we wanted to improve his starting performance. So he was Olympic champion in uh, London in 2012. And this is a test that we did before Rio. What you see here is that if you look at the right part of the picture, his force velocity profile is the black line here. And the optimal profile to push here with a 30 degrees angle, like in a swimming start, is much, much, much higher on the force side. So our conclusion was, hmm, maybe he could improve his performance by improving the force side of his profile. So this is, the philosophy is, what is your profile? What is the optimum? And can we feel the difference? So to give you another very clear example, this is two, I think it was football players, the one on the left has a pretty good power output, 31 watts per kilogram, but he has a difference between his profile and the optimum profile. So we call that a deficit. He has a force velocity deficit of almost 50%. Look at his performance, squat jump, 37 centimeters. Now look at the right. On the right, you have someone who has a bit less power output, 27.8, but this is someone who has a good balance. He has no imbalance. He has the optimal profile. Look at the jump eight. The jump eight is better 
than the other athletes. So the conclusion is the second player has a better jump eight, even if he has a bit less power output. So now you start to understand the question. Okay, so immediately the question from the coach is this one. Can we change the profile and can we orient the profile with training, specific training, to go to this optimum? And this is what we answered after. So the first study that we did was um, training some people to go to their optimal profile. So this was done in Spain by Pedro Jimenez. And so we did a nine-week training program, which has a little mistake I will explain later. And for 46 athletes, we trained them according to their force velocity deficit. So very simply, if your deficit is a force deficit, you will do a lot of maximum force. If your deficit is a velocity deficit, you will work on maximum velocity, etc. The control group, every athlete did the same program, and this is not optimized. So I'm going to present you the result of that study like this. So here you can see the red line is the optimum profile. So sorry, it's a bit uh, down. It should be at 100. So the red line should be at 100%. I moved some things on the, on the slide, sorry. But what you need to understand is that the individuals here on the top have a high velocity deficit. They are super strong, but they are not fast. And the people here below are super fast, but they are not strong. And so the philosophy of the study was, let's give everybody what they need individually. So we did some subgroups, five subgroups, and we gave the subgroups different training programs. At the end of the protocol, every athlete, except one, changed their force velocity profile. And as you can see here, they all tended to go towards the optimum. So it means that our training was efficient in bringing every athlete closer to the optimum. In the other group, we gave everyone the same program and we saw very variable adaptations. Now in terms of performance, jump eight, in the non-optimized group, we saw an improvement in jump eight that was not clear, 2% plus minus 5%. This is not clear. Only seven subjects improved their jump eight. And in the optimized group, all the subjects improved their jump eight, and the average improvement was more than 12%. So it means that the conclusion of the study was the optimized training is a bit better than uh, a, a training that was, individu uh, that was not individualized. So we did another study to confirm this prim uh, these first results, and the new study was a bit better because we did two things that was improved. First, the duration of the program was not fixed. It was not nine weeks for everybody. The duration of the program was individualized as well. So it means you start the program, we check every three weeks your change in profile, and when you reach the optimum profile, we stop the program for you. So this is a bit different um, ID. And the second thing that we did is that we checked what happened after the program. So this is the first result. This is every individual. This is very important in sports science to show every individual changes, not only the group average. Because when you coach people, you don't coach a group, you coach individuals. And what you see here in the bottom of the slide is everybody going to 100%. And you need to understand that here you have three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks, like in the previous study, but then 12, 15, 18 for the individuals who needed more work to go to the optimum. And then once you reach the optimum, if you stop training specifically, what happens? 
What you see here is that when you reach the optimum, you reach your maximum jump height, which is good. And then jump height decreases a little bit. But what's important is to see that the optimum profile remains about the same for three weeks. So it means that if you do a specific training to change the profile and then you stop that, you know that you will keep some effects at least for three weeks, which is, for example, important when you prepare for a tournament or you prepare for a final, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a question from the coaches was, OK, I know how to improve my force. I will use heavy loads in training. But how can I improve my velocity? So here, it's very simple. You have to think about this graph. And you have to say, OK, if you want to stimulate the velocity part of the profile, you have to use exercises below body weight because you need to move faster than a squat jump. So you have many possibilities. You can use your arms. You can use counter movements. You can also use, of course, elastic assistance because you will jump faster, so you're more stimulating velocity. You can also use very simple exercises like this one. I love this exercise. It's very simple and it's very easy. You bounce on the ball and then you jump very high. So this is very fast. Um, I will show you here an exercise that I found on the internet. This was an exercise that was published by the rugby physical coach of the Australian girls. So they are Olympic champions in rugby. And so you can see here, she's using an elastic to pull down, and then she jumps very fast and very high because she's using the elastic energy. So this is very cheap, and this is very efficient. The last exercise that we propose, uh, and I hope the video will be visible. Yes, it is. The last exercise is a horizontal jump. So this is very easy. You just need to find a board with wheels, and you push horizontally. And when you do that, you go very fast because you don't push against gravity. So there's almost no resistance. And this is super fast. And also, this is why you use an elastic to go back to the wall. Otherwise, it's, it's not very practical. So in summary of this first part, I would say that training people is like using a toothpaste tube. When you have a toothpaste tube that's full, you have plenty of toothpaste and plenty of possibilities. You can do whatever you want. You will get some toothpaste. OK, you know that. You can press anywhere. You will get some results. So this is what you have with young people, beginners, new athletes. Whatever you do, poof, they improve. Now, if you talk about high level people, elite people, you have an empty, an empty toothpaste tube. It means if you push with the same methods, you will get no result. Like here, if you push there, you will get no toothpaste. So you will have to find some more margins of improvement. And it means you will need to do something else. And I like to say that innovation is not doing the same better. It's doing something different. And I think the optimal profile approach is something different. All right, so the second part now will be about um, sprinting, and it will be about the horizontal profile. So in sprinting, there's a big problem, and this is something that we have reviewed in the literature with a young guy named Matt Cross. The big problem is this one. In sprinting, people move 10 meters to 12 meters per second. So it means if you want to measure the force and the velocity in these athletes, that's going to be difficult. And today, there's only two possibilities. You can run on a treadmill that is instrumented. And I'm lucky to work in a laboratory where we have this kind of treadmill. The other one is in Doha, in Qatar. Or you can find a laboratory where you have some force plates into the track. So again, there's only a few places like this in the world. One famous place is in Paris. The other one is in Japan. So if you use these ones, you can measure the force and the velocity. 
like this. Here is an example. This is an example of my colleague sprinting on the treadmill. Okay? But basically, you get some really nice data. This is an example of the laboratory in Japan. This is the study by Ryu Nagahara. It's a, a colleague of mine. And he has 50 meters of force plates in his lab, which is, it's incredible, okay? It's, it's amazing. But basically, if you're a coach, there's almost no way you can access to these devices, okay? So this is very, very frustrating. So the same story is repeating now with my colleague, uh, Pierre Samosino. We decided to try to find a method to calculate force and velocity in sprinting from simple devices. So the method is based on a very simple uh, but impressive fact. When people accelerate, anybody, humans in, in good health, when we accelerate, the running speed increases in a very exponential way. So we observe that in elite sprinters. This is a file from the French sprinter, Christophe Lemaitre. The velocity increases exponentially. We observe that in team sports players, football players, rugby players, even ice hockey. This is also the case for the record of Usain Bolt. The increase in speed follows an exponential equation. I observed that on my son when he was three years old. I asked him to accelerate and whoop, the acceleration followed the same pattern. And we observe that also in very old sprinters. This is the file of a sprinter who was 96 when we tested him, and he also increases exponentially. So basically, the method says, if you know the velocity, you can calculate the acceleration, and if you know the acceleration, you can estimate the force output. So this is based on the laws of Newton, and as you can see here, we can calculate the force velocity output in sprinting. This is the black trace. And to validate this model, we compare that to the force plate data in the INSEP in Paris or in the Japanese laboratory. And what do you see here? You see a very good agreement between the simple method and the force plate data. So basically, we were super happy because you can now estimate force velocity profile using simple inputs, body mass, and running speed. It is reliable. We validated the method in two different studies, and it's easy to use in practice because all you need is a sprint acceleration. So it's not a very difficult test. Of course, we also published some Excel spreadsheets that allow you to do the computations uh, in a simple way. You just have to enter body mass, the running speed, and the spreadsheet calculates everything. And a friend of ours, uh, Pedro Jimenez, the same Pedro Jimenez as before, uh, decided to build uh, an iPhone app because when you film a sprint with a very high frame rate, 240 frames per second, you can estimate the displacement of the body and if you can estimate the displacement of the body with very, very basic biomechanical laws, this was done by the French biomechanist, Etienne Jules Marais, in, uh, 19, in 1885, you can recalculate the force and the velocity output. So the application is my sprint, and it uses our equations. So this was very cool, and it was validated in a, in a comparison study. And so it means that you can go and analyze the force velocity profile specific to sprinting. So what you see here is the force velocity and power profile of Usain Bolt during the world record. I was not there, but I used the velocity data that were published by the organizers, and I could calculate everything, and I know the maximum force output of Usain Bolt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a good estimation. Now, what can I do with that? The applications, in my opinion, there's two applications. One is in training. The other one is around injuries. So in training, 
very simply, the force velocity profile allows you to analyze things in more detail. Look at this test. So this is a test that we did with football coaches. 40 meter test, okay? They do the test, they run. One is 6.21, the other one is 6.37. And so if you just look at the times, you could say, okay, this one is slow, and we are going to do some sprint work with him. But if you look at their force velocity profile here on the right, what you see is that one of them is very, very fast. The other one is very, very strong. And so the conclusion here is, well, he should not work on sprinting. He should work on improving the maximum force because he has a lot of maximum velocity. And his problem is at the beginning of the sprint. You see, so it means that you will go deeper into the analysis of your athletes. So this is an example of a rugby club in France I work with. So this is three players, and the three players have exactly the same time on the 30 meter. You see, 440, 441, 442. But if you look at their maximum force and maximum velocity, you see three totally different profiles. One of them has a high maximum force, a low maximum velocity. The two others are different. So our philosophy is to say they should not get exactly the same training. We should change a little bit some things for everybody to be faster. Because if you give them the same training program, maybe they will not adapt very well. So basically, here is exactly what we are doing now. What we are doing now is some training studies to answer the questions, what training input, what stimulus will improve the different parts of the spectrum, the different parts of the profile, okay? So I don't have time to go into details, but if you want to read the papers that we have published so far, uh, we have published already six to eight studies on this topic, and you can go and see the results that we obtained. Now let's go to the injury part of the talk. I will show you how to use the force velocity profile in the injury management process. So in my opinion, injury is a management process. It is not prevention or rehabilitation. It's an entire circle between preparing and repairing. So we are going to talk about hamstring injuries mainly. Basically, the first idea is very simple. Um, the idea is to follow the player's data to get some vision of the changes in profile of the players during the season. Because when you do some testing, for example, every month or every two months, and you see some values changing, you can say, hmm, the player is losing velocity or the player is losing force. And I'm very happy to see this kind of, of um, philosophy because in my opinion, the first prevention in sports is the training content. What you give to the players is related to the risk of injury, in my opinion. So here, for example, you remember the three players. We have some clear examples of players who need maximum speed work, some players who don't need maximum speed work, and so we can modulate the training content. And in my opinion, if you do too much maximum speed with a player and it is not requested, maybe you have a risk that you can avoid. The idea is to lower the risk. So in this paper by uh, Caroline Finch and colleagues, it is clear that, and I will read that sentence, sorry, the key concept behind monitoring training loads for injury prevention is to screen the athletes so that the workload can be adjusted. The main word in this sentence is the word adjust the workload, okay? So this is the idea, and I think, as you can see here on the left, we do that with football players. I think it's a good way to adjust the load. 
Now, let's imagine that the player gets injured. You can use the profile in the return to sports performance process. So be very uh, careful. It is not return to sport. It is return to performance. What you want is not just play football again. What you want is play football with maximum acceleration, very intense plays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in 2017, we published a study where we used the sprint test as the final step of a rehabilitation program. So it means you have a hamstring injury. Okay, we will do a very, very detailed program. So it's in the paper if you want to read the different steps, but I want you to see here the table with the different steps. And the final step of that program is sprinting. So we consider that the rehabilitation is not over until you can sprint to your maximum effort. You see? So this is very important because if you say the rehabilitation is over, but whoa, 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 you cannot sprint, there is an issue. So the last step is mechanical performance in sprinting. So here, of course, the important data is, the golden data is the pre-injury profile of the player. Because if you don't have this pre-injury profile, then you don't know where you need to go, okay? So I'm going to give you a very direct, concrete example of that. Here, we have a professional rugby player that we work with. And at the middle of the season, he has a major hamstring injury. So basically here, you see the first test, he was not injured. The second test, he was not injured. And then he did the rehabilitation. And at the end of re the rehabilitation, we said, you need to do a sprint test. So they did a sprint test and the data were not back to normal. So the coach and the physiotherapist, they said, okay, we need to work more. The rehab is not over. We will work more on sprinting. And then we did a second test. And at the second test, all the data were back to normal, as you can see here. And I would even say that his maximum force and maximum velocity were even better than before. At that point, we said to the coaches, okay, for us, the rehab is totally over and is back to performance. So, of course, I don't know if um, it's the reason, but this player had no other injury at the hamstring in that season. So he did not have a re-injury. So now a student I supervise, his name is Johan Lati, said, okay, maybe we can use the sprint profile as a prevention tool. Okay, is there a risk factor in some specific profiles? Can we investigate that? So this is something that we are doing now, but it's a very complicated study. So we are assessing the sprint mechanics of football and rugby players. We want to know how they run. We want to know their force velocity profile because then we want to see if there are some connections with hamstring injury risk. So I cannot tell you today the result of that investigation, but I advise that you follow the works of Johan Lati. And um, he did some conferences that are online on YouTube and it's very interesting. And so we are now waiting for uh, the players to play the season. And unfortunately, due to the COVID situation, we had to stop that study, but we will start that study again uh, very soon. All right, so I think we will have uh, plenty of, of time for questions because I want to uh, spend some time on, on questions and discussion. So it's just the beginning of many, many other researches. Okay, so we just put our hands on something. And um, I want to say uh, merci in French uh, to you for uh, listening. And uh, I am ready for uh, questions and discussions. Gracias. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Maureen, for your excellent and fascinating presentation. Uh, where you're talking about of uh, about practical tools to evaluate evaluate the force velocity profile. 
and how can you use that 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 information to individualize, individualize uh, the the training program, right? Uh, so thanks again. Uh, we have several questions, so we will yeah. start to to the round table. We have a question from Esteban Aedo, and regarding the instrumented treadmill presented in one of your uh, slides, are there difference in both activated muscles and muscle activity compared to a non-instrumented treadmill and track in in the sprint in, in, in the track? Yeah, so definitely yes, but this has not been clearly studied because there is no study comparing instrumented treadmill to track for the same people at the same time uh, because simply there is no lab in the world where you have instrumented treadmill, track, instrumented, and non-instrumented treadmill, but <laughs> When you compare uh, similar athletes um, on the track or on the treadmill, you have very similar kinetic data and you have pretty similar EMG activation patterns. So it means that uh, when you see the EMG activity on the treadmill, that's instrumented, and you see the activity on the track, basically it's about the same pattern. But of course, there is no direct comparison. Uh, there has been recently a review of literature, and basically my, my opinion is that, of course, treadmill will never be like the track, definitely. But I think in terms of output, when you compare people, uh, the comparison is still informative. Okay. So, for example, if, if I activate more my hamstrings on the treadmill than you do, very likely on the track, it's going to be the same. Okay, perfect. Perfect. We have another question uh, from Sebastian Cerda. Can you use uh, the counter movement jump to assess the force velocity profile? And if yes, how valid and reliable is? Yes, yeah, so this is why I like the, the questions because you can address some things that were not in the presentation. Uh, so yes, um, CMJ is a very popular modality, even maybe more popular than squat jump. So yes, we, everything that I presented for the squat jump has been tested and validated exactly the same for the CMJ. So the simple method I presented works with the CMJ. Uh, the optimal profile calculation work with the CMJ. So I would say that yes, you can do it exactly in the same way. The only thing that you need to uh, focus on is that you need to be able to calculate correctly the downward distance the starting distance of the CMJ, but otherwise everything is the same. So in the, in the CMJ, uh, you need to, to put the, the same push-up distance uh, in, in every single jump? Yes, and you need to know the exact push-up distance because you will use it in the, in the computation. So, But in our experience, this is pretty easy to do. And when the athletes are familiar with the test, with the CMJ, they are really reproducible, so it is not a it is not a big uh, limitation. Okay, very nice. I have uh, another question: If data data normalization is so essential in biomechanics, for example, power is normalized by by kilos of body weight of um, or muscle mass, right? Uh, why yeah. do you see? Do you think uh, jump height is not normalized? For example, normalized by the total height or length of the lower limbs, among others. Yes, this this is a very interesting question, and I'm, I'm going to um, explain it very simply. Um, force or power, they are muscular capabilities. This is your your muscles, your body acting. Jump height is not a muscular capability. Jump height is a performance index. So it means that if I play basketball and I want to jump and catch the ball at the rebound, or if I play volleyball and I want to jump to do a spike, I use jump height. I don't use jump height per unit of uh, lower limb or whatever. So basically, we don't normalize jump height because it's a performance variable. 
Another example, if I run a marathon, you will take my time at the marathon. You will not divide it by my body mass or by my VO2 max. You know, sports performance is not normalized. Of course, in some sports, you have weight categories because weight is very important. But in some sports, the, the performance is not normalized. So we have to differentiate jump weight from muscle capabilities. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have another question. Nowadays, velocity-based training is a widely used method. Yeah. Uh, regarding the velocity component of the force velocity profile, what is the use of fullness in both evaluation and training prescription uh, with this method, with the, the velocity-based training? Yeah, so this is very interesting because to me, the interest of the velocity-based training is to say for every individual, when you use this load, you will push or you will produce this amount of velocity. And so remember when you, when you want to work and stimulate some specific parts of the profile, velocity-based training is the key. Because, for example, if I want to stimulate the left part of my, of my profile and I see that I'm going to be around 20% of my lowest velocity, I can check that my exercise and the load I use actually put 20% stimulus. If I want to work at 80% of my maximum speed, velocity-based training will allow me to check that I am exactly in that zone. So I would say that I'm pretty happy that today velocity-based training is replacing load-based training because the problem with a load is that it's a number of kilograms. It doesn't tell you the force or the velocity that you will produce. You see what I mean? So it's, it's about the same discussion as before. Uh, we go from an external value, for example, kilograms, to an internal production velocity. So this is, I think it's, it's, it's a very good shift in the, in the training uh, methodology. Okay, but, but only in, in the training part or you, you, you can use it for, for, the, for the evaluation of the F, F, FB profile? Because, because you, you can extrapolate uh, theoretically yes. the, the, the strength with the, with the velocity. But so this is this is the big this is the big um, it's not a detail when you do velocity based training what you extrapolate is the maximum load it is not the maximum force you see what I mean so um, you you know my maximum load at the bench press yeah. but to calculate the force I produced you need to measure very accurately the velocity so there's a, a small difference between load and force so. Uh, but basically, to me, a good evaluation has force velocity testing and load velocity testing. Because load velocity testing will allow you to work specifically uh, on the force velocity profile. Perfect. In general terms, how important is sprint technique in team sports? Okay, so you have one hour more. <laughs> um, um, in general terms, my opinion is that um, sprinting seems natural for anybody. And if you're any football player, any basketball player, everybody sprints. But we have to understand that there's a way to sprint that is effective and there's a way to sprint that is not much effective. So it means... Technically speaking, uh, you can be very fast without a good technique, but technically speaking, there are some, uh, let's say, non-negotiables. There are some key variables that need to be there if you want to sprint fast as a team sport player. So take your favorite team sport, take the fastest players in your team sport, they all have that minimum trunk position, Uh, limb cycle position, contact time, etc., etc., and I would say that we don't need to focus too much on technique, but we need people to have this minimum uh, validated. So I would say, 
it is important. It is not the top variable, but it's important to have a minimum technique to be a good team, well, to be a fast team sport player. But you know, I'm a big fan of basketball, and, and in history, there has been some very good basketball players, and they were not fast at all. So it means it's just one physical quality, and physical qualities are just one piece of the puzzle, okay? So it will, it will not make you a good player, but it's a key physical quality. Of course. And maybe in soccer is more important than in basketball, for example. Yes, and also in, in, in modern soccer, yeah. in modern football, even, even um, uh, rear play, back players, they need some speed, so. Okay, great. Um, Inter's question, Ignacio Solar, thinking about sport climbing. Yeah. Are there force velocity profile uh, measurements in upper limbs? For the climbing? Yeah. Yes, so there has been some there has been some research on that. Uh, it has been published by a, a French group. They did some some uh, pull exercise where they measured some force of the pulling uh, exercise, and they put some load on the body to have different points and to do a force velocity in the arm pull exercise. So. This is very interesting because it means that if you focus on a very specific movement and a very specific sport, you can think about uh, getting some testing. Yes, but so far um, there has not been more work than that. Okay, perfect. There is a technical question. Do you recommend the two-point method to simplify the evaluation? So I'm going to be very honest, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't use it because I tell you, if, if you want to get some very accurate data, you need to spend time on testing. If you want to have a fast testing, you have a risk of inaccurate data. But it has been proven and it has been published by um, uh, Amador Garcia Ramos, who is a, a researcher, that yes, you can use only two points to do the entire force velocity profile. So the research says, yes, you can, if everything is very accurately done. And I observe the same thing. But my practice is to say, guys, we want to have a good test. So we want to spend some time on it. And so we are going to use three or four points and not two. But if your context is, sorry, we don't have time, but we want to generate some data anyway, then Yes, you can use the two points method. So it's it's basically up to the time you have and the time you want to spend. But the two point method has been validated, so it works. Okay. Uh, the optimal profile is thinking on jump performance. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but that performance, you can you can can you extrapolate that results to performance in a sport? For example, as soccer? No. No, clearly no, because um, if, if, if I ask you to jump and I say, okay, I think you're that kind of player and that kind of level, I would be a clown. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, we have to differentiate between physical capability and sports performance. And as I said before, um, there's much, much, much more than jumping in, in football performance. But this is not the objective. The objective of our research is to say, if you want to improve jump performance, then you can go with this approach. And I, I was a, a football player myself. If you tell me, will I be a better football player if I jump 5% or 10% more? My answer is yes, because there will be some situations during the game where you will defend better, you will attack better. And if you think about Cristiano Ronaldo, there has been many, many important actions in his career where jump eight was involved. So, of course, it is not the only... Um, Leo Messi is one of the best players ever. I'm not sure he has a good jump eight, you know? So it's just a part of the equation. Yeah, of course, of course. We have a question from Ulysses, Bionut, I don't know if 
for right but how do i know the optimal profile of my athlete and regarding a specific sport yes yeah, so uh, basically the, the optimal profile is only for jumping but you can test any athlete from any sport and the computation is a big equation that we validated in a, in a scientific paper and to facilitate the coach's work this equation is integrated into our excel spreadsheet so basically i would say that if you enter in the spreadsheet the load and the jump weight it will calculate the optimal profile okay Uh, regarding long-term athlete development, uh, how important could could be the, the uh, to assess and monitor yeah. the force velocity profile in young athletes? That's a very interesting question because we we don't have much um, data on that uh, because simply the method is is pretty new, so we don't have a long-term feedback. But um, we have started some work in football and, and basketball to see how the profile change in the same players. This is important because if you, if you compare different players of different ages, it will not tell you anything. So we try to get some players in academy to see what happens when they go in the professional uh, field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for now, I would say I think it's interesting because I think it can give you some information about the response to training, you know, and uh, but nothing has been done so far. So I think it's it's like any other physical test. It will tell you how the athlete changes when they improve their performance or not, and then you can think of it. But first, you have to measure it. Okay. We have another question from wait a minute, uh, Felipe Hermosilla. Mm -hmm. If we don't have technology to assess, for example, a sprint, to know that, yeah. can we use, for example, a chrono? How, how reliable is, is that assessment? Yes, so I would say that basically, yes, you can, but you have to make sure that the timing is accurate and you have to time every five meter to have uh, at least five or six points to calculate everything. So my answer is, if you're able with a chrono to get some accurate measurements, uh, you, can, you can use the method. And this is why I like this uh, application, my jump, my sprint, because my sprint is allowing you to film and get the times. But if you only have a chrono, then it's going to be difficult. And I understand this, this is a field method but you need some devices to, to use it. Yeah. Regarding to neuromuscular fatigue, there is some, some variables. When, when you assess, for example, the CMG, you have the, the ratio of the, the, the contraction time and the, the flight time. With, mm -hmm. the, with the force velocity profile, can you use some, some of the variables uh, to monitor acute neuromuscular fatigue? So yes, because um, we did some studies where we tried to see uh, when you repeat some sprints, so it was with uh, elite rugby players, when you do some repeated sprints, you can see that the profile changes. So it means that in fatigue, some, some parts of the profile change and we also observed that during long-term fatigue over a season. So we did some measurements during the entire season in football, and we saw also some changes. So I would say the profile will change as a result of neuromuscular adaptations. We don't know yet exactly what type of neuromuscular adaptations are related to what type of change in the profile, but the first step was that, yes, when you are fatigued, we see some changes, clearly. Okay, in some presentations, I saw that, that, that you present that this profile, when you repeat sprints, right, the, this profile changes. And yeah. that was related with 
risk of injury in, in so some two yes times. The, yes so this is an hypothesis so this is something that we are testing now the idea was to say um well first after injury you have a different profile so it means when you come back to training and you come back to play after a hamstring injury your profile is not exactly the same and the typical change is you have the same maximum speed but you have a lower maximum force output so this is this is a first step and the second step is to say do you have a change in the profile before an injury so it means can we anticipate a change in the risk with the profile and the answer to this question we don't have yet we only have preliminary data but as you can imagine we need a lot of data to be sure or not if there is a link a prospective link so we are still investigating that okay perfect we have the last question the last question okay what do you think about the variable of rate of power development and related or related to the as a performance indicator in in counter movement jump or squat jump or another jump can you repeat the beginning the weight See, the so weight power the rate of power development ah okay um so this is a this is a big limitation of our method is that it is too macroscopic to tell you uh this variable influences the jump weight we only focus on the the average force that you can produce during the push but so we don't know exactly the 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 role of rfd or rate of force development um we only know that you need maximum force output or average force output but we know from other studies that rate of power and rate of force development uh, is very very important in in sports performance but this is another type of assessment because to assess rate of force development you need some some force plates and you need some some heavy equipment yeah of course of course okay dr martin to finish your presentation can you give a final message uh, to the coaches that are, are listening to you well so my my final message would be uh, try to think about your athletes in more individual terms because even if they have the, the main message is even if they have the same performance in jumping or sprinting it doesn't mean that they have the same muscular capabilities so if you only focus on performance maybe you miss some things that that could be that could be very helpful for your training okay thank you very uh, sorry Thank you again for your knowledge, for the presentation, cool. uh, for your time, uh, and that's it. Be safe, and we keep we keep in touch. Same. Bye bye. Bye. Be everybody safe. Bye.